going to do a swap, yeah, and we will um, um, talk about putting pressure on Steve. I'm sure you're up to this. Sorry. Our, no we're going to swap. Our, our next speaker is um, Steve Flavelle, the Lister Brothers Associate Professor here at MIT. And his talk title is Recording and Understanding Neural Activity Across an Entire Brain. And we'll get that slide up. All right. Can everyone hear me? Yep. All right, excellent. So I'm excited to share some of the work um, that we've been doing here in my lab. And as background to the talk that I'll give today, I'll just start by saying um, that obviously, as we all navigate our environments, we generate behavioral responses to sensory cues that we detect. Uh, but we don't always respond the same way to the same sensory cues. So for example, the sound of a floorboard creaking in our home might seem innocuous in the daytime, but that same auditory stimulus might elicit a fear response uh, late at night after watching a scary movie. And so instead, the way that we process sensory cues and behave, this is modulated over time. And in virtually all animals, it's modulated over long time scales in a state-like fashion. And so these internal states that influence our sensory processing and behavior are uh, familiar to all of us because we experience them every day. So the most stark examples of internal states that influence our behavior are, of course, the main sleep and wake states. But in addition to those, there's this wide range of motivational, emotional, homeostatic, and behavioral states that similarly influence sensory processing and behavior over really long stretches of time. And so our ability to record from many neurons throughout the brain has improved dramatically in recent years. And so this has started to reveal some neural correlates of these types of states. And one thing that's really emerging from that work is that these states are typically accompanied by extremely widespread changes in neural activity. This is just an example I like that was uh, published a few years ago, where researchers recorded from thousands and thousands of neurons in a mouse, spanning dozens of brain regions in the mouse while it was thirsty or not thirsty. And as you can see, uh, there are neural activity changes indicated by the color in virtually every brain region based on this simple homeostatic state of thirst. In addition, over the last few years, uh, work from many groups has shown that even like the granular moment by moment behaviors of an animal, like a mouse moving a limb or moving its face, are also surprisingly uh, broadly represented in neural activity in many brain regions. And so this has started to give rise to a view that in most brain regions, there's ongoing representations of behavior and internal state. But fundamentally, the way that the brain encodes or represents behavior and how state influences this is really poorly understood. And so as you can imagine, this is an immensely challenging problem to try to approach given the vast size and complexity of mammalian brains. And so I want to tell you, what I want to tell you about today is our efforts to do this in a much simpler system. And along the way, I want to highlight a lot of the technological innovations, molecular genetic, engineering, and computational innovations that are necessary to do this kind of work. And so the animal that we're studying is this roundworm right here, C. elegans. It's much smaller in reality, about a millimeter long. And we study this animal because there's this amazing genetic tool set uh, that we can use to study the animal's very compact, well-defined nervous system. So uh, C. elegans has exactly 302 neurons in its brain. Those neurons are always in the exact same place. And what's more, they're connected through this fully defined wiring diagram. So this is the only animal on the planet where we have a full blueprint of its brain. And even though it's a very small brain, it basically uses the same building blocks as, you do, as are used in bigger brains, and it generates a surprisingly rich behavioral repertoire. So what we wanted to do in this animal was to record activity of all the neurons across that wiring diagram, as well as its behavior, and build models of how the neurons encode behavior, and then see what happens when the animal switches states. So to do this project, we had to first of all use molecular genetic approaches and make transgenic animals. And so we made a transgenic worm that expresses this protein called GCAMP in all the neurons. And GCAMP is a, a fluorescent molecule that gets brighter when the uh, neurons have increased activity. And so then we took these animals that basically have these uh, fluorescent indicators of activity in all the different brain cells, and we put them under a microscope that we engineered in the lab. And it's kind of a funny microscope. So what happens is that the worm uh, is right here. There we go. The worm is right here in the middle, and it can move around freely. And it's basically two microscopes in one. So below the animal, there's a, a light path that allows us to do 3D volumetric imaging of the worm's head rapidly. That allows us to see all those calcium changes, these G-camp signals going up and down. And then above the animal, there's this low mag bright field setup that is, allows us to take pictures of the entire animal so we can quantify behavior. And importantly, this image up top is analyzed in real time, millisecond by millisecond, uh, with a deep neural network that figures out where's the head of the worm, 
where's the worm going? And this automatically controls the microscope stage to move around and literally chase after the animal. And so this allows us to do kind of brain-wide imaging in an unperturbed, freely moving animal. Okay, so this is what data looks like off that microscope. And so if you're a graduate student and you finally got your recordings on this complicated microscope, this unfortunately is the nightmare scenario. So because as you can see on the right, while we've managed to get the animal's head in the field of view, as it moves, it literally bends and warps its brain. And so we have thousands of frames of a video, and so how on earth are we gonna find a calcium, a, a neural activity trace out of this video? The same sphere detected over thousands of frames. And so when the pandemic hit, a lot of people, uh, we got these data right before the pandemic. So when the pandemic hit, a lot of people picked up hobbies. Uh, like some people learned how to bake sourdough bread and things like that. And so two grad students in the lab, Adam Atanas and Jung Soo Kim, made their pandemic hobby writing software to unwarp the worm's brain. So they brought their computers home and for months worked on this software package. And I won't you know, torture you with the details, but suffice it to say, this is a really hard problem that re required a lot of software engineering to basically do this and extract signal without motion artifact, which is the real problem. The upshot of all that hard work is shown here. So this is a, a, an example data set that we recorded. And on the left is a stack of neural activity traces of about 150 neurons in the worm's head, simultaneously recorded over about 16 minutes. The color indicates the level of activity, so you can see different neurons have different dynamics. Some neurons have like correlated dynamics. And then over on the right is the behavior of that same animal, behavioral variables related to locomotion, feeding, steering, and navigation. And so the, the game that we wanted to play at first, like I said, is to figure out how that neural activity encodes this behavior. And so we wanted to do this precisely so we could see what happens when the state switches. And so in order to do that, we had to use tools for math and computational tools. And precisely what we wanted to do was we wanted to model each neuron's activity. We wanted to build a model of each neuron's activity that predicts its activity as a function of behavioral variables. Not because the brain's activity is a consequence of behavior. Obviously, the inverse is true. But formulating things in this way allows us to precisely describe how each neuron encodes features of the animal's behavior. OK, so this is what we did. The, the form of the model that turned out to really work well in the worm's brain is below. And, um, and the uh, end result of that modeling effort is kind of shown here. So these are four different neurons that we recorded in blue is the neural activity trace. These neurons represent very different aspects of the worm's behavior. And then the overlaying orange trace is our model that we trained on each of these neurons and the fit of the model to the neurons. And as you can see, the, the model does a nice job describing the activity of these neurons. And so this doesn't just work for those four neurons, it works for thousands of neurons that we've recorded over dozens of animals. And we think that this model captures most of the variants in the brain related to the worm's behavior. And I say that because we've done an analysis of the residuals of the models, which is basically like all the activity in the brain that we didn't explain, what does that activity look like? And there are dynamics in the brain not explained by the model, but a, a careful analysis has revealed that that really isn't related to behavior. Those might be sensory variables, internal variables, and things like that. Now importantly, this model is very interpretable. So we can go to a given neuron, build a model, and look at the model parameters and be like, this neuron encodes velocity, steering, and things like this. Importantly, if we want to make claims like that, we needed to be able to estimate our confidence or uncertainty in those model parameters. And this technical note down in the bottom right here just says that we collaborated with Vakash Mansinga here in BCS, who developed a really uh, a robust approach to be able to do that. Okay, so now we have neurons, we have models, we can say how all these neurons relate to behavior. How do we map that back to this physical structure, the wiring diagram? And so for this, we needed to use molecular genetic tools again. And specifically, we could take advantage of the fact that every neuron in the worm's brain is genetically just distinct, just like it is in our brain. And so we could use a strain where a number of different fluorescent molecules have been expressed under extremely well-defined genetic control elements, genetic drivers. So that way, the way to think about this is that you, we've made a transgenic worm, or actually Oliver Hobart in his lab made this transgenic worm that, um, that uh, has a fluorescent barcode for each neuron. Every animal from this strain is identical, and so like the M1 neuron, which is a neuron that we can map back onto that wiring diagram, is always blue. And so then what we can do is we can uh, do our GCAMP recordings. We can make these brain-wide measurements. And at the end, we just immobilize the animals, snap all these pictures of this multispectral fluorescence. And then we can map our results back onto the physical wiring diagram. And this has allowed us to build this atlas 
out of all, how all these neuron classes in the C. elegans wiring diagram encode behavior. And so I won't torture you with the details of this plot, though I could talk about this plot for like at least an hour or two. But the, the columns of the plot here are uh, the different C. elegans neuron classes, and the rows tell you features of how those neurons encode behavior, and this was learned from that, from that modeling approach. And this was what was known before uh, this study, so there were a number of neurons that people had studied in detail in single neuron studies, and our results match the uh, expected encoding based on that previous work, but now we can dramatically expand this analysis to really this kind of brain-wide scale. Okay, so last slide. Uh, I wanted to circle back to this question that I raised at the beginning, which is how the state of the animal impacts this representation of behavior across a brain. And so we were excited to look at this right away because we saw that in our recordings, there would be moments where we'd be recording a, uh, an animal moving about, and suddenly a uh, about 50, sorry, 20 percent of the neurons in the brain would change how they represent behavior. And we thought that might represent ongoing internal variables of the animal. So to really try to test that uh, directly, we did an experiment as follows. So we basically made these brain-wide recordings, and then suddenly, partway through the recording, we delivered a stimulus to the animal that triggered a, a behavioral state change. And what we did was we used an infrared laser to warm up the region around the worm's head. Worms are cold-blooded, and so they hate this stimulus. It only lasts for a few hundred milliseconds, but it's sufficient to uh, induce a very strong avoidance behavior, a reversal, and to suppress their feeding. And then for many minutes after this extremely transient stimulus, the animals are alarmed, aroused, and moving about with different behavior. And so it provides a very uh, easy way for us to suddenly switch the state of the animal. And then as you can imagine, the name of the game is to look at these neurons and see what changed. And so here's an, an example neuron that we recorded in gray. And what we did is we trained one of those models to predict its activity as a function of behavior. That's the overlaying blue trace, so we've trained a good, pretty good model to explain this neuron's activity. And then we look at what happens when the animal's behavioral state changes. And as you can see, when the animal enters this highly aversive state, the gray neuron still has activity. Its activity is still going up and down, but our model very suddenly fails to explain anything about that neural activity. And in fact, a different model now explains how that neuron encodes behavior. And so again, we see this in about 20% of the neurons. And the way to think about this is that there's been this flexible shift in the network that remaps the relationship between neurons and behavior. And this happens, again, not in the entire nervous system, but in a large fraction. And we can map exactly out where in the connectome these types of changes are happening based on that kind of fluorescent barcoding approach. OK, so to summarize, what I told you is through engineering, we were able to um, uh, perform these brain-wide recordings in animals that were freely behaving with simultaneous measurements of behavior. And then through computational approaches, we were able to build models that explain how all these uh, neurons encode features of behavior. And then combining that with these molecular genetic approaches, we were able to uh, build up an atlas of how the defined cell types across the worm's brain encode behavior. And then finally, based on that last slide that I just showed you, we're getting a sense that this network is highly flexible and can shift and change the way that the neurons map onto behavior. And so we're using these technologies for a lot of other projects in the lab at this point. Um, so for example, uh, a longstanding interest of the lab is to understand the modulatory systems of this animal, the serotonergic system, and all these highly conserved modulatory systems. And as you can imagine, the technologies I just described to you are a great, great way for us to understand how serotonin acts on the brain and changes activity throughout the brain and the functional uh, uh, mapping onto behavior. In addition, these uh, methods can be used to ask questions about where memories are stored in the brain, and also uh, our existing data sets already would be great data sets to use to build other classes of models of brain function, like dynamical models in effort to like simulate the worm's brain, as opposed to the class of models I described to you. Okay, so I will, uh, most important slide, I want to acknowledge uh, the folks who did this work. I'm uh, blessed to work with an amazing group of lab members uh, shown in this picture, that's the current group. And these projects were really, as you can imagine, because they're interdisciplinary, were really team efforts. And just to highlight that, um, Niji and Nate Cermak, back when they were postdocs in my lab, they were the ones who really engineered these moving microscopes that are essential for all these projects. And when they left, they basically handed the baton over to Adam and Jung Su, who are the two uh, fabulous graduate students who did this project that I described to you today. But Adam and Jung Su didn't work alone. They were joined by uh, Ziyu Wong and Eric Bueno, two amazing research technicians in the lab that were integral to all those experiments. I also mentioned we collaborated with Vakash and folks in Vakash's group. And then I also mentioned that we're applying these tools 
to the serotonergic system, and all these projects require teamwork, in that case, by Candy, uh, Ijeoma, and Ur. Okay, and I also want to thank our funders, finally. Uh, in particular, I really want to highlight the, the funding of the JPV Foundation. Without them, uh, literally none of this work would have been possible. Yeah, we've definitely looked at that. So like another way to think about the brain's dynamics, obviously, we, the, the models I described to you are very much single neuron models, right? But another way to think about the brain's dynamics is kind of shared activities across neurons. And we've done analyses to try to look at those shared dynamics across the neurons. These would be things like principal component analysis and things like this. And the brain's activity, the worm's brain, it, its activity is lower dimensional than 302 neurons, so the neurons share dynamics. And the neurons have very heterogeneous loadings of those dynamics. So each neuron kind of carries some of these different main modes of dynamics in the brain. And something I didn't go through the details of it, but even at the single neuron level, you get these neurons that have representations not just of like one motor program, but they're conjunctively representing, for example, the movement of direction of the animal and the steering of the animal. And see, these types of representations could be important for the animal to kind of coordinate uh, its behaviors in an important uh, fashion. So, so we see things like that, actually. Uh, uh, and there's a whole way of looking at the brain involving these dynamics that I didn't talk about today. Yeah, great point. Other questions? Yes, sir, over there. Aside from the aversive behavior with the warm uh, lit spots, can these uh, worms create an internal map of their environment? In other words, how extensive is their memory? Yeah, excellent question. So, so to our knowledge, there is not an internal map of the environment, so they don't have like place fields and these like amazing phenomena that are in mammalian brains. Um, they have pretty remarkable memory, though, given that they're operating with a pretty, uh, you know, small nervous system. And so, the more the most striking form of memory in them is that they can form long-term associative memories. So they can uh, the, the the stimuli that they're good at detecting are temperature, uh, taste, and odors. And if you give them an odor that they don't really care about, but you apply it to them while they're in the presence of food and you test them later, they'll learn to love that odor. And if you give them the odor in the absence of food, they'll learn to hate that odor. And so you can actually, and those memories can last in some cases for days. And so that's actually something, actually Adam, who was one of the people on this project, thought that his project would be to quickly figure out where that kind of memory is stored in the brain. Turns out we had to figure out a lot of other things first, both engineering and models to get at those questions, but those types of things could be approached now, yeah. One of the fun parts about being moderators, I get to come up with questions, and I'm gonna come up with sure. one for you, if you don't mind, Steve. As a technologist, I, I found, I mean, the whole talk is fascinating, but cool. the, the, the capture system, the microscope system seemed really amazing. Mm -hmm. Where else can you use it? Uh, you know, what would you do with it in terms of other studies besides just looking at C. elegans? Yeah, people have started to do this in other bigger animals. Um, and so like uh, Drosophila and things like that as well. And this kind of idea like of steering uh, light paths towards specific populations of cells, like I could imagine could be ac applicable for other types of advanced microscopy and big systems as well to steer things around as, an, as you're making live recordings. Um, but the, the size of the, or, the, the microscope we built, unfortunately, is extremely tailored to the organism, so it can be used for exactly one thing as far as we can tell, but that's what we want to use it for, yeah. That's great, good. Thank you very much, Steve.